no, none of that. Yeah. Hey, none of that. Now just calm down. Yeah. You calm down. You take it easy. We're in Kentucky today as we delve into the unbelievable tale of Cletus Robbins Jr., a man who dared to challenge the authority of a judge in a way that no one could have ever imagined. In this video, we will take you through the gripping crime background and prosecution that led to this wild confrontation. Brace yourself as we uncover the shocking events that unfolded in the courtroom as Cletus Robbins Jr. hits back at the judge with a vengeance. Get seated for his sentencing following a three-day trial as he was convicted for an array of charges such as kidnapping with serious physical injury and robbery in the first degree, among many others. It was a sunny afternoon in the small town of Oakwood. The community was known for its peaceful streets and tight-knit neighborhoods, but behind the idyllic facade, a storm was brewing. This storm would soon engulf the lives of its residents, especially that of Cletus Robbins Jr., a name that would soon become synonymous with controversy and defiance. Born and raised in Oakwood, Cletus had a troubled upbringing. Growing up in a broken home, he found solace in the wrong crowd, leading him down a path of crime and rebellion. As a teenager, Cletus fell into a life of petty theft and vandalism. His criminal activities escalated over the years, earning him a reputation as a troublemaker within the community. But it was one fateful night that would forever change the course of his life. It was a moonlit night when Cletus and his gang decided to break into the local jewelry store. Their plan was meticulous, or so they thought. Little did they know that their every move was being watched by the vigilant eyes of law enforcement. As Cletus and his accomplices forced their way into the store, the alarm blared, alerting the police. Chaos ensued as the gang scrambled to grab as much loot as they could, but their escape was cut short when the police arrived, surrounding the store. A high-speed chase through the streets of Oakwood ensued, with Cletus and his gang desperately trying to evade capture. The pursuit came to a dramatic end when their getaway car crashed into a lamppost, leaving them trapped and at the mercy of the law. Cletus Robbins Jr. was charged with multiple counts of burglary, theft, kidnapping with physical injury, second-degree assault, as well as evading arrest. The evidence against him was overwhelming overwhelming, leaving little room for doubt. The courtroom was filled with tension as the judge presided over the case, fully aware of the gravity of the crimes committed. The prosecution presented a compelling case, painting Cletus as a dangerous criminal who threatened society. Witnesses testified against him, recounting the terror they had experienced during the jewelry store break-in. It seemed like Cletus's fate was sealed. After a lengthy trial, the jury delivered their verdict, guilty on all charges. Cletus Robbins Jr. was about to be sentenced to a lengthy prison term, ensuring that he would pay for his crimes, but little did anyone know that this would only be the beginning of a shocking and unprecedented turn of events. Just minutes into the sentencing of Cletus Robbins Jr., Assistant Commonwealth Attorney Jonathan Lee asked the defendant not to talk to anyone at his table except his attorney, as per normal court rules. Your Honor, Commonwealth will request the court uh, give notice to the defendant not to communicate with the Commonwealth. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's fact, just don't, stand don't, don't be turning around. But Robbins had something to say about that. Hey, hey, hey. Now, none of that. Hey, hey, hey. hey, none of that. Now, just calm down. Yeah. You Stand calm down. You take it easy. Stand up up there on that side, please. Settle down, please. Welcome. Dirty ass f***ing court here. <sighs> Listen, buddy, I'm too old for this. Hey. I'm too old for this, too. The judge later hands him a heavy sentence and confines him to prison for a maximum of 25 years. But the session wasn't over for Robbins. He still had a lot on his mind to say. <laughs> That sound you heard was the sound of Robbins Jr. spitting at the prosecuting attorney. Before he is ejected from the court, he makes one final threat. No additional charges were filed against Robbins for his courtroom misconduct. His 25-year sentence still stands. I'll ask my lawyer right now. Are you speaking to me? Welcome to Douglas County Courthouse for the hearing of 32-year-old defendant Sahara Fakir, who has been charged with armed robbery, burglary, and murder. In today's sentencing, we bring you the chilling tale of Sahara Fakir, a name that sent shockwaves through the small community of Douglasville, Georgia. Join us as we explore the dark and twisted events surrounding Sahara Fakir's involvement in the murder of Jeremy Wheeler, a beloved local businessman and father. From the disturbing crime scene to the controversial defense that left everyone astounded, this story is 
filled with shocking twists and turns. Get ready to uncover the truth behind Sahara Fakir's crimes and the bizarre answers she gave during her trial. It was June 19th, 2013, when tragedy struck the peaceful town of Douglasville. Jeremy Wheeler, a beloved local businessman and father, was going about his day, completely unaware of the horror that awaited him. Little did he know that his neighbor, Sahara Fakir, would be the one to bring about his untimely demise. Jerry Wheeler, a 66-year-old resident of Douglasville, was in his home on River Run Drive, preparing dinner for himself around 2 p.m. It was a seemingly ordinary day until Sahara Fakir, his 32-year-old neighbor, allegedly entered his home and committed a heinous act of violence. The Douglas County Sheriff's Department received a call from Officer Michael Wheeler, Jerry's son and a deputy sheriff himself. Michael had discovered his father's lifeless body and initially believed it to be a natural death. However, upon closer inspection, it became clear that Jerry had been brutally stabbed to death. The crime scene was a horrifying sight, with blood splattered across the walls and the house in disarray. The responders were met with a gruesome scene that left them shaken to the core. Within a month of the murder, the authorities made a breakthrough in the case. Sahara Fakir, a member of the Custodians of Faith and Jerry Wheeler's neighbor, was arrested and charged with murder, armed robbery, and burglary. The charges against Sahara were based on the match of a footprint found at the crime scene, linking her to the murder of the beloved local businessman. The arrest of Sahara Fakir brought some relief to the community, but it also raised many questions. What could have driven her to commit such a brutal act? And what would her defense be during the trial? As the trial began, the community and the media were eager to hear Sahara Fakir's side of the story. Would she plead guilty, or would she present a defense that would shock everyone? Sahara Fakir's trial would soon become a spectacle, as her defense took an unexpected turn. Sahara Fakir's trial was a highly anticipated event, with the community seeking justice for the heinous murder of Jerry Wheeler. As the proceedings began, all eyes were on Sahara, waiting to hear her defense. But what unfolded in the courtroom left everyone astounded. Sahara Fakir, representing herself in court, took an unconventional and bizarre approach to her defense. She claimed that the courthouse itself was cursed and demanded her immediate release. Her unapologetic demeanor and shocking statements left everyone in the courtroom bewildered. When they sign the courthouse, I understand that. I understand that this courthouse is a cursed courthouse. Yes, I understand. Okay. And if you are judging me, you're not God fearing, I'll allow me to have the judges for you. And everyone else in here is not God fearing. In a chilling moment during the trial, when the judge questions her about her legal representation, more bizarre answers keep coming. You have a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer right now. Are you He's speaking to me? Are you going to get a lawyer? Allah is my lawyer right now. And if you do not release me, Allah will have his vengeance on you. It's like he did in 2009 when he sent that flood. It's only going to get worse. Sahara's belief in the curse and her unwavering conviction left everyone in the courtroom astounded. But despite her bizarre claims, the jury had to focus on the evidence presented against her. The prosecution presented a compelling case against Sahara Fakir, highlighting the overwhelming evidence that pointed to her involvement in the murder of Jerry Wheeler. The jury had to weigh the evidence against Sahara's unconventional defense. The jury's verdict was swift and decisive. Sahara Fakir was found guilty of the murder of Jerry Wheeler. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Sahara Fakir's conviction sparked a wave of controversy, with some questioning the sanity of her statements and others intrigued by the depths of her beliefs. The trial had captivated the nation, leaving many with lingering questions about the motives behind Sahara's actions. To this day, Sahara Fakir remains behind bars, serving her sentence for the heinous crime she committed. Her case continues to be a topic of discussion, with many trying to understand the complexities of her mind and the true extent of her involvement in the murder. The court Room drama surrounding Sahara Fakir's trial and her bizarre statements will forever be etched in the annals of true crime history. After being found guilty of the murder of Jerry Wheeler, Sahara Fakir was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The community breathed a collective sigh of relief, knowing that justice had been served. But what has become of Sahara Fakir since her conviction? Sahara Fakir's conviction sparked discussions about the motives behind her actions and the depths of her beliefs. Many wondered if her bizarre statements during the trial were a true reflection of her mindset or a calculated defense strategy. Psychologists stated that Sahara Fakir's case is a complex one. Her statements during the trial suggest a strong belief in a higher power and a conviction that she was an instrument of divine justice. It raises questions about the intersection of religious beliefs and criminal behavior. While Sahara Fakir's current whereabouts are not publicly disclosed for security reasons, her case has left a lasting impact on the community and the justice system. The Wheeler family continues to cope with the loss 
of their beloved father and the trauma caused by Sahara's actions. The impact of Sahara Fakir's crimes extends beyond the Wheeler family. The community of Douglasville, Georgia, has been forever changed by the tragedy that unfolded in their midst. The case of Sahara Fakir also highlights the dedication and hard work of law enforcement and the justice system in bringing criminals to justice. The swift verdict and conviction demonstrated the overwhelming evidence against her. Sahara Fakir's story serves as a cautionary tale, reminding us of the darkness that can lurk within seemingly ordinary individuals. It is a chilling reminder that evil can manifest in unexpected ways. If you want to be in the room or not. Do you want to suck my I prefer not to, sir. Take your seat and welcome to Volusia County Courthouse in Florida, where we delve into the shocking case of Alan McCarty, a man whose explosive outbursts and threats towards a judge left the courtroom in utter disbelief. This is the pre-trial hearing of Alan McCarty, who was charged with making death threats against a judge, who he mistakenly believes abducted his children in a custody case 14 months ago. In this gripping tale, we witness the unimaginable as McCarty, facing serious charges, unleashes a torrent of profanities and curses towards circuit judge Stasia Warren. Despite being restrained in handcuffs and leg shackles, McCarty's rage knows no bounds, leaving everyone in the courtroom stunned. Join us as we explore the details of this extraordinary case, where McCarty's threats and insults extend beyond the judge to his own defense attorney. We'll take you through the courtroom chaos, the judge's stern warnings, and the shocking aftermath that resulted in McCarty's lengthy prison sentence. In the quiet and seemingly ordinary courtroom of the Justice Center in Daytona Beach, Florida, a storm was brewing. The stage was set for a dramatic confrontation that would leave everyone in shock. This is the story of Alan McCarty, a man whose anger and frustration reached a boiling point, leading to a series of events that would forever change his life. It was a typical day in the courtroom, with Judge Stasia Warren presiding over a case that would soon take an unexpected turn. Alan McCarty, a 36-year-old man from Milton in Santa Rosa County, sat in the defendant's chair, his face etched with anger and resentment. Little did anyone know that this seemingly ordinary man harbored a deep-seated rage that was about to be unleashed. McCarty's troubles began long before he set foot in the courtroom. He believed that his children had been unjustly taken away from him, fueling a growing sense of frustration and desperation. As the custody battle raged on, McCarty's anger festered, and he became consumed by a desire for revenge. I am not under oath. This is being done unconstitutionally. These all took my kids unrightfully. You won't allow my witnesses here. The events leading up to this explosive courtroom confrontation started months earlier. McCarty had made numerous calls to 911, venting his frustrations about Judge Warren and the custody decision. Dispatchers who answered his calls became familiar with his angry rants and threats, but little did they know that these calls were just a glimpse into the darkness that lurked within McCarty's troubled mind. I got a gun pointed at your building. Sir, what is going on? Who the are you calling, sir, you stupid on one particular call, McCarty's rage reached new heights. He directed his anger towards the unborn child of a prosecutor, making vile and disturbing threats. The severity of his words sent shockwaves through the legal community, and the case took on a whole new level of urgency. The trial was a tense affair, with emotions running high on both sides. McCarty's defense attorney, Ryan Bellinger, did his best to navigate the turbulent waters of his client's volatile behavior. But even Belanger couldn't contain the storm that was brewing within McCarty. Throughout the trial, McCarty McCarty's outbursts became increasingly frequent and disturbing. He hurled insults and curses at everyone in the courtroom, including his own defense attorney. The atmosphere was charged with tension as those present braced themselves for what was to come. And so, the day of reckoning arrived. McCarty sat in the courtroom, his hands bound by handcuffs and his legs shackled. But these restraints did little to quell the fire that burned within him. As Circuit Judge Matt Foxman addressed the court, the tension in the room reached its peak. The hearing started on a wild note, with the defendant flipping the finger at the judge and refusing to answer. I'm not under oath, the defendant kept repeating. This isn't even the judge who allegedly took his kids. This innocent judge is under fire for an imaginary crime another judge committed. And the back and forth continues. If you want to be in the room or not. Do you want to suck my I prefer not to, sir. Well, you got a mouth for it. Gotta get some more to I got a lot more custom doing. I need drug weapons. Do you want to be here when the jury's here? What the f do you think? I don't know. I need you to answer. Judge Foxman revealed the shocking truth about McCarty's threats towards the unborn child of a prosecutor. The revelation struck a nerve, and McCarty's anger erupted like a volcano. He is making this up. I was never sworn in. I have not been sworn in at all. You're, you're a f liar. Thank you very much.
Thank you, sir. Chaos ensued as Judge Foxman ordered McCarty to be removed from the courtroom. Deputies rushed to restrain him, but his screams and curses continued to fill the air. It was a scene of utter mayhem, with the echoes of McCarty's rage reverberating through the halls of justice. You wanna f***ing take my kids from me and act like that? F*** you and that f***ing You get lay off of me? Is that what you're gonna do? No. Well then do it again, come on. Shut the up, I'm trying to think over here. On the road. It's not. Yes, sir. McCarty was dragged away, his voice fading into the distance, but the impact of his explosive outburst would linger, leaving everyone in the courtroom shaken and disturbed. Take all my paperwork so you, I can't f show these people. You want to take all my paperwork from me? Lock me in a cell f***ing all night? As the echoes of Alan McCarty's explosive outburst faded away, the courtroom was left in a state of shock. The consequences of his actions were about to unfold, and the weight of justice would come crashing down upon him. Removed from the courtroom, McCarty found himself confined to a small room behind the courtroom. Handcuffed and shackled, he could still hear the proceedings through a speaker and observe the events unfolding through one-way glass. It was here that he would witness the aftermath of his own rage. McCarty's trial had been marked by disruptive behavior and confrontations, but his outburst during the sentencing hearing took his defiance to a whole new level. His words had struck a nerve, and the judge was determined to ensure that McCarty faced the full consequences of his actions. Circuit Judge Matt Foxman wasted no time in addressing McCarty's contemptuous behavior. He emphasized the severity of the threats McCarty had made, not only towards Judge Stasia Warren, but also towards the unborn child of a prosecutor. The judge's words were stern, reflecting the gravity of the situation. The courtroom was filled with a mix of shock, disbelief, and a sense of justice being served. The impact of McCarty's words reverberated through the room, leaving everyone in no doubt about the severity of his actions. Ryan Belonger, McCarty's defense attorney, stood by silently, his face a mask of resignation. McCarty's mother, present in the courtroom, chose not to speak but expressed her apologies for her son's behavior. The weight of McCarty's actions hung heavy in the air, affecting all those involved. Judge Foxman, with a firm resolve, handed down the sentence. Alan McCarty would face 20 years in prison for his threats against Judge Stasia Warren. Warren, but the consequences didn't end there. The judge also imposed an additional 10-day sentence for contempt of court, a direct result of McCarty's outburst during the hearing. The courtroom was filled with a mix of relief and satisfaction as the sentence was handed down. The severity of the punishment reflected the seriousness of McCarty's threats and the need to protect the integrity of the judicial system. State Attorney R.J. Lariza, in a statement, following the sentencing, expressed his belief that the 20-year sentence would give McCarty ample time to reflect on the gravity of his actions. It was a stern message to anyone who dared to threaten the sanctity of the courtroom. The consequences of McCarty's outburst extended beyond the prison sentence. The additional 10-day sentence meant that he would not be eligible for placement in a work release or community release center during his time in prison. It was a further blow to McCarty's hopes of a more lenient confinement. Once McCarty completes his prison sentence, he will then serve his 10-day county jail sentence, a reminder of the contempt he showed towards the court and the need for accountability. The courtroom drew drama surrounding Alan McCarty's threats and outbursts had far-reaching consequences that extended beyond the walls of the Justice Center. For Judge Stasia Warren, the experience was nothing short of traumatic. McCarty's threat struck at the very core of her role as a judge, undermining the integrity of the judicial system. The weight of his words lingered, leaving her with a heightened sense of vulnerability. McCarty's outburst highlighted the challenges faced by the legal system in dealing with individuals who display such extreme behavior. It raised important questions about courtroom security, the protection of judges and court personnel and the need for stricter measures to prevent similar incidents in the future. The incident prompted a review of security protocols within the Justice Center and sparked discussions among legal professionals about the importance of maintaining a safe and respectful environment for all involved. The case sparked conversations about the need for better mental health support, anger management programs, and conflict resolution strategies. It highlighted the importance of addressing the underlying issues that can lead individuals to resort to such extreme behavior. State Attorney R.J. Lariza, in a statement following the sentencing, emphasized the seriousness of McCarty's threats and the need to protect the integrity of the judicial system. The community at large expressed a mix of relief and concern. While many were relieved that justice had been served, there was also a sense of unease about the underlying issues that had led to McCarty's outburst. It served as a reminder that there is still work to be done in addressing the root causes of such extreme behavior. The case also highlighted the importance of supporting and protecting the 
those who serve in the justice system. Judges, prosecutors, and court personnel play a vital role in upholding the rule of law, and it is essential that they feel safe and respected in their work. As we conclude this video, we are left with a sobering reminder of the impact that anger and threats can have on individuals, communities, and the legal system as a whole. The case of Alan McCarty serves as a cautionary tale, urging us to strive for a society built on respect, understanding, and accountability. If you enjoyed this video, check out our other awesome videos on the channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.